Hello, my name is Dr. Sophia Farrell, and I am an alumna of the SSGF program. Today, I'm going to share one research project that I worked on during my PhD through the support of the SSGF, which is an enhanced approach to analyzing signals from the xenon N10 experiment using machine learning. The xenon N10 experiment is a direct dark matter detector that is filled with several tons of liquid xenon, and its goal is to observe rare particle interactions. Its technology enables a range of other extremely sensitive search efforts, including those of neutrinos and rare nuclear decays. And while neutrinos pose an irreducible background for dark matter searches, as depicted by the blue gradient of neutrino background introduced to dark matter interactions in the figure on the right, they also offer unique opportunities to study neutrino properties. And neutrinos are in many ways the least understood of the standard model particles. So this is an exciting opportunity for the xenon n ton experiment. Due to their weak interactions, we need high fluxes of neutrinos to study them. One such source is our sun, which provides neutrinos with energies that interact in the detector's observable energy range, basically of less than 100 kilo electron volts. The weak force scattering between neutrinos and electrons in atomic uh, xenon in the detector contribute the second leading background in xenon N10 at low energies. And while this is only a background component of a few events per day, enhancements due to possible neutrino properties are theoretically observable as well. One such well-motivated enhancement to the interaction of neutrinos with target electrons is due to the neutrino's effective electromagnetic coupling to electrons in the detector measured through a quantity called the neutrino magnetic moment. If the magnetic moment value is uh, significant enough, it would indicate that neutrinos are their own antiparticle. So it's critical to measure the strength of this coupling in order to understand the nature of this particle. This measurement in the xenon N10 experiment amounts to detecting uh, less than about 5 kiloelectron volt enhancements in the electron scattering rate, but this is limited by how efficient our detector is right at this low energy threshold, as well as our treatment and understanding of how these low energy signals would appear in data compared to a host of backgrounds that we also observe. The xenon N10 detector operates as a dual phase time projection chamber. So when a particle interaction occurs, it, energy is deposited in the form of two observable signals, primary scintillation, which we call the S1 signal in the data, and secondary ionization, or the S2 signal in the data. These two signals are observed by arrays of photo, photo multiplier tubes at either end of the detector. And from their characteristic shape, size, and time delay, the signal's position, type, and energy can all be inferred from the data, uh, giving us information about the characteristic interaction that took place. In this talk, we're interested in interactions that occur with atomic electrons in the detector called electronic recoil or ER inter interactions. Reconstructing these important physical quantities about an interaction occurs in several steps, each sequentially trying to filter the high dimensional data that is read from the detector sensors into increasingly physically meaningful variables that we can use to infer something about physics or particles. This objective to reconstruct our data into these variables comes at the cost of processing and even introducing new backgrounds into the data, which then have to be characterized before an analysis can be sensitive to new rare interactions. For instance, in the typical data stream of just a few milliseconds, uh, hundreds of signals can be recorded. Accurately identifying the physical scintillation and ionization signals in this data stream from numerous backgrounds confidently is a challenge for us on the analysis end. Furthermore, another challenge is to classify signals right at the threshold of detection where just one photon or electron is recorded as a signal. And these types of signals can often overlap in their shape and require statistical techniques to handle how we classify and characterize each one. 
Conventionally, signals are classified by looking at a few dimensions of interest that aim to represent the full signal data, such as the signal size and its general duration, and creating a manual boundary in this downsampled representation space to classify scintillation or S1 signals from ionization or S2 signals. However, these few quantities are not always engineered to convey the full signal shape, meaning two things. One, that unwanted backgrounds are not identified at this stage of classification. And two, that misclassifications are bound to occur and be propagated through our reconstruction framework. So our first aim, therefore, was to reduce the reconstruction-induced errors in our data by using the full recorded signal for more accurate classification. So I'll describe now the Bayesian network model that I developed and quantify its improved classification performance. Specifically, we'll observe the performance of what is known as a naive Bayes classifier. And this is a highly powerful graphical model that uses Bayesian statistics to tackle a high dimensional problem in a scalable way. So our objective was to use this model to classify the type of signal, whether sig scintillation or ionization sourced according to the high dimensional detector data. The Bayesian networks have many tunable features. We use a combination of experimental and simulated signals as our training data, looking at the low energy region of interest for this analysis. And we chose to represent the data essentially as a waveform. In this waveform representation and also providing the model with, with information about the waveforms transform known as the quantiles here depicted on the second row of this figure, uh, one can see that in general, the prompt scintillation, that is the S1 signal in green, and the delayed ionization, or the S2 signal here in purple, from a given energy deposition in the detector can look very different from each other, owing to the physical processes that actually generate these two very different signals in the data. So after training this waveform-based classifier, its performance was evaluated compared to several baseline methods, including both the conventional downsampled representation uh, algorithm of classification, as well as a standard neural network method that we developed for comparison of our models. The new naive Bayes classifier method that I developed and trained significantly outperformed the other classifiers, reducing the error rate by several factors for any given case. Upon examining experimental data at the threshold of signal production, where only one electron was recorded from the detector, the naive Bayes classifier was able to classify signals with less bias in the dimension of reconstructed variables that are then later used in analysis and further reconstruction. So this reduction in bias uh, of our reconstruction framework led us to favor this new classification approach for the sake of scintillation and ionization classification. Furthermore, the naive Bayes classifier outputs a statistically meaningful value, indicating the model's confidence at classifying a given signal as a scintillation or ionization source signal. So what we wanted to do as a second step of this study was to use this model output in an innovative way to characterize experimental signals in a full-scale analysis according to the model's confidence of classifying the signal. Because of the high number of backgrounds originating uh, not from true interactions of interest in the detector, it's important to have selection criteria on the data that accept only signals of true interactions within the detector volume and energy region of interest with a high level of confidence. So I'll present the results of using the naive Bayes classifier model output to perform this selection. The novelty of this approach is in returning to the lower level data in our reconstruction framework of these experiments to extract physically meaningful values from the data. Here, the NBC model output. This value can then be used to infer the physical source of the signal directly from the waveform. And while when this uh, selection upon the naive based classifier output is employed in practice on the calibration data, we observed a high level of background re rejection outside of this 
band of interest of uh, true calibration events of electronic recoil interactions. And this band would essentially mimic where signals would appear from novel neutrino interactions or other uh, nuclear decays or events of interest in our data that we discussed earlier. Additionally to this good background rejection outside of this region of interest, we can again use sources of experimental calibration data to calculate the efficiency of the naive-based classifier method of data selection compared to a conventional approach. And this comparison showed us that we obtained a few percent increased efficiency in our selection of data for analysis by employing this new, more effective form of signal characterization. And this is essentially because this new method looks at the waveform as a whole and how signals appear in the data data rather than having to perform sequential reconstruction steps on our data along our path of inference. So we get a, a good robust rejection of our backgrounds with an added increase of signal efficiency as a bonus. So upon applying this method to look at the highly anticipated uh, first data from xenon Enton and characterizing a host of backgrounds that we know will appear in our data detailed here in this leftmost column, the first results from the xenon Enton experiment showed excellent agreement with a background only hypothesis of the data. And essentially this means that no evidence was found for a significant measurement of novel physics in this regime, including of the neutrino uh, electromagnetic coupling or the neutrino magnetic moment in this first data. Comparing the new Bayesian network based method of signal analysis in red, to the previous conventional method here in blue, one can observe a higher average acceptance of events in the data across the energy regime of interest, owing to the improved detection efficiency of this new method. Furthermore, one interesting result from this search is uh, the measurement of the ultra sensitive a uh, kind of measurement of the very rare monoenergetic double beta nuclear decay of xenon 124, which is this peak in the data right here. And because of our excellent ability to reduce unphysical backgrounds in the data in this regime, we were able to make this highly confident measurement of observing this decay in the xenon n ton detector. And uh, this observation is to date the longest half-life decay ever directly observed. So further measurements of this kind and of the other nuclear decays in this regime that you can see, including of xenon-136, uh, will continue to inform us of nuclear structure, decay modes, and novel decay mechanisms that could indicate new laws of physics with added data and observation. The results of this first analysis of xenon enton also yielded the most sensitive direct detector search effort a measurement or limit of the neutrino magnetic moment, which continues to help us exclude potential parameter space for this variable, and by extension helps us to understand the nature of the neutrino a little bit more. Among many other exciting avenues where we're applying Bayesian networks in the future, one that stands out to mention is the use of Bayesian networks to perform a fully probabilistic analysis from raw data recorded by the detector. Bypassing several steps of reconstruction, which have, as of now, been thought to be a prerequisite to these analyses, has already been proven to be effective in our analysis shown here today. And I believe that this innovation will continue to shape how we analyze rare nuclear and particle detectors for fundamental and applied physics in the coming years. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about one of the projects that I worked on during my time as a PhD student. I'd like to thank both my advisor at Rice, Professor Aaron Higuera, and my practicum team at Livermore, namely Adam Bernstein and Mark Bergevin, for their uh, for working with me on a very exciting reactor antineutrino study, which we're publishing this summer. And lastly, I am extremely grateful for the SSGF and the Krell Institute for providing uh, me this opportunity and supporting my many research projects during my PhD. Uh, this fellowship has been truly an incredible opportunity for me to grow and develop, uh, to learn about stewardship science and advocate for uh, the stewardship science mission and to grow in a, as, a, as a scientist myself as well. So please reach out to me with any questions you have on my work at my email below and thank you.